to everyone for coming. Um, how many people were here in the first session? Okay, maybe half. Okay, good. So we're going to do a quick overview of uh, the first session. And uh, this is a continuation of what we hope is going to be a quarterly, so every three months, um, uh, teaching sessions on apologetics. Um, please ask questions. <clears throat> so if, but when you do, so I, 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 I have to repeat it because the people on the, uh, the video can't hear what you're saying. So please do ask questions. I hope everyone will. But when you do, try to keep it concise because I have to repeat it so, they, uh, so that they can hear what's going on. Uh, on the on the audio, there is a partial bibliography at the end. Also, if you need, if there's any questions about words or uh, <clears throat> uh, some of the references that I'll that I'll talk about, there it's at the very end of the slide pack. Okay. <clears throat> so, what is apologetics? <clears throat> uh, first, it does not mean to apologize. It means literally to uh, provide a defense. And that's, that's it's, it's from a Greek word, apologia. Uh, uh, and like I said, it's, it's a branch of Christian theology that has to do with providing a rational basis for the belief. It, it takes the Bible as a historic, as a document, as any, any ancient document. It does not require that it be treated as the inspired word of God, even though it is, but it does not re uh, require that. There's a couple things that are, that are important in, in this context. One is general versus special revelation. General revelation is, is, the, is God revealed in nature, philosophy, rational uh, uh, argumentation, that kind of thing. It does not require any supernatural uh, revelation of God, which is special revelation, which talks about uh, uh, the, the, the insight that you would gain into, the, into, the, into God as a result of reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit working within you. There are two broad divisions of apologetics. One is offensive, one is defensive. The, the offensive uh, section attempts to provide arguments for the existence of God. Defensive tends, uh, will will provide uh, a, a defense to answer some of the objections to, to uh, the existence of God. In this section, we're going to look at some of the objections to God's existence. In the first session, we provided some of the, the offensive arguments. So broadly, this is uh, apologetics, the, the various categories. Like I said, there's offensive, the reasons for faith, and defensive objections to faith. In the first session, uh, which is online, we talked about uh, the evidence for the historical Jesus and the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. This time, we're going to talk about the reliability of the Bible. But it's a, it's a very, very, very broad um, uh, subject matter. Every single one of these has stacks of, of books and you know, dozens of PhD theses on each one. So, but again, we're just going to just do one today. So, uh, today's session has to do with the, re with, the, with the reliability of the Bible. And even that, we're taking kind of a, a very small piece of that. <clears throat> so, some of the common arguments against the Bible. So, we have no idea what the original Christian claims are. Uh, we don't know if the Bible originally contained historical information. And there's going to be, today as we go through this, there's going to be two gaps in view. And I'm going to use Josh as 33 AD. So Josh is 33 AD. Christian is 70 AD. And why that is will become apparent. And uh, Jonathan is present day. So we're going to look at these gaps between the events of 33 AD, the recording of these events in, in 70s, and then present day, Jonathan. So remember those gaps. We're going to like just go over and over and over that today. So the, the first bullet, we don't know if the Bible originally contained historical information, is we don't know if, if 
Christian, what he wrote down, reflected what the events of Josh's time. Even if we did know that, even if Christian did write it down properly, we don't know if it got to Jonathan, right? So it had to get from 70 AD to present day, and we don't know if that, that occurred. The Bible is full of contradictions and discrepancies. The authors of the Bible belong to primitive cultures, believed in miracles, which obviously we know cannot happen. Um, the God of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, violent, genocidal, prejudiced, and unjust. Uh, Non-canonical gospels, such as Thomas and Barnabas. Um, we're not going to get into canon today, but it's an argument that there are other gospels that are not included in the Bible, and don't they disprove what, what is there currently? Uh, the Bible's the descriptions of nat nature and history are hopelessly at odds with what we know are true. Um, and, and lastly, uh, Christians can't even agree on what the Bible's saying. This is a theology question, right? The Christians can't agree on, on all this stuff. You've got, you know, hundreds of different um, uh, groups. Nobody can agree what the thing says. So why should I take this thing as, as true? We're going to just do the top three today. We're going to look at those things. Did the events of Josh get to Christian? Did he write it, those events down correctly? And did they make it to Jonathan? So quickly, what is the Bible? Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I, I think probably most people know it. it. It's primarily the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in uh, Aramaic Greek. Um, it's 66 books by 40 authors over 1,500 years. Um, uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint is, is very important. Again, uh, not going to spend a ton of time on this. This is an important slide simply because I want people to see the 33 AD, right? So right under that uh, cross bookmark, is 33 AD, and that's Josh. And what you want to look at is the gap in time between 33 and 70. If you can think of like like uh, First John, the John's right there. That's about 70 AD, and we're going to talk about why 70 AD is so important. But it, it's it's pretty compressed. So what you see is that there's a huge flurry of activity in that 25, 30 year time span. Uh, one in, so how do we know 33 AD? Uh, a, a, a lot of research has gone into this. You know, when I was doing this, um, I came across uh, the journal of, uh, and there's a link in the bibliography, the Journal of International Geology Review analyzed earthquake activity in first century Palestine and came up with the date of Friday, April 3rd, 33 AD, based upon earthquake activity. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on the Old Testament timelines, because primarily here today we're concerned with New Testament. But, uh, yeah. So let's look at this. And we're going to park here for a little bit. 33 AD. So James was written 11 to 15 years after Christ's crucifixion, right? The vast majority of the New Testament is written between 45 and 70 AD. Now, wh again, what is 70 AD? Does anyone know what happened in 70 AD? I know at least one person does. The, the second temple was destroyed by Rome. So after... Israel came back from the Babylonian captivity. They resettled in Israel. They built the second temple. It was this massive structure. And they were there from six, when did Nehemiah come back? 600s in that time frame? Uh, Nehemiah comes back 413. 413. There you go. So they come back. They rebuild the second temple. Huge community right there. They rebelled against Rome uh, in, fifth, in the 60s, in the mid-60s A.D. Rome had finally had enough of Israel. 
They came in, they marched on it, they lead siege to Jerusalem, and they destroyed the temple. They raised it right to the ground, destroyed the temple. Now, that, it, like I said, that's important because the dating of this, if you look in Acts, how does Acts conclude? Acts concludes with Paul is in prison in Rome. There's no mention of, of uh, the, the, the destruction of the second temple, none of that. So the, the, the reasonable, the, the dating that kind of makes sense is to put Acts prior to 70 AD, since none of it's mentioned. Um, Luke, Luke and Acts is a two-part series. Luke precedes Acts, so Luke is before 70 AD. Luke, you, Luke and Matthew use Mark as source material, so Mark is before that. So virt, every, all scholars place Mark, the Gospel of Mark, as the first gospel, right? And that has, all of that has to have occurred before 70 AD. Now, I say this because there are a lot of liberal scholars. There is liberal scholarship that places Mark. Most, if you look at Wikipedia, Wikipedia is a good source if you, if you want to talk with people and say, look, Wikipedia says that. That's kind of the secular consensus, right? Uh, Wikipedia puts Mark uh, at 65 to 70 AD. So we're going to use that date. Now, I think it's much more reasonable to place Mark in the late 40s. But when you talk to people, you don't want to get hung up on that, on that early dating and argue about that. Just use what's in Wikipedia. That, that, that's kind of the simplest thing to do. So we're going to say 25 years. We're going to say 25 years from Jesus' death to the first gospel. We're going to use that number for the entire presentation. And like I said, a reasonable dating is it's actually probably more like 15, but that's what we're going to use. Now, the other thing you're going to hear from people is, well, getting from Josh to Christian, 25 years, life expectancy in uh, early Rome is what, 20, 25, 26 years old? 20, you know, those people were gone. So there's a really important thing to understand about that. The, the reason the life expectancy was so low is because of this incredibly high infant mortality. So as a mom, you could expect to lose 50% of your children. That was the norm, to lose 50% of your children. Now, so what, what happens is, is if you, if you make it to when you're 19, your life expectancy at that point is 72 years. Now, today is 79. That's what our, that our average life expectancy is. But in first, so it was actually not that different. So again, if you made it to 18, you were going to live to 72 years old. So we know that people that were alive in 33 AD, original witnesses, were there at Christian's time in 70 AD. So a person that was 25, right, is 50 years old. Now, you know, if you think 25 years, so how many people over 50 here? We have a lot under 50. So think about this. For the people under 50, think about in 25 years, will you remember the events of the last two years, COVID? Pretty big, right? A massive uh, uh, societal changing event, I guarantee you're going to remember it. For those of us that are older than 50, do we remember where we were 9-11? Clearly, right? Princess Diana died 28 years ago. The Nancy Kerrigan attack, which probably like five of us understand. But yeah, that, that, was, that was 30 years ago, right? So that... These are the kind of time frames that we're talking about. Okay, so now we're going to go from <clears throat> Josh. Uh, sorry, we're going to go backwards. We're going to go from Christian to Jonathan first, since that's the easier one. 
So we're going to go from the events of the authorship to present day. All right. <clears throat> so there's two problems in view here. Uh, if there's any South Park, I'm sure there's South Park people here. You know Thump, right? So the telephone game is a very real problem. He tells her, tells him, tells him, tells her, tells him, right? By the time you get to the end, what you have at the end doesn't resemble what you started with, right? The second problem that's in view, and Steve's not here. I thought he was going to be here. Um, is, is the fish that you told everyone you caught versus the one you did catch, right? Exaggeration, right? Which we all do, right? So these are the two problems because the, the, the getting from Josh to Christian is oral, all repeating, right? The story gets to that. He writes it down. You write it down. You got to get to there. When you write it down, when you copy and recopy, doesn't that introduce a lot of errors? So here's the argument. <clears throat> the disciples told stories to gain a following. <clears throat> so that's Josh. These, toys, these stories get told and retold and retold and retold and retold. They're in circulation year after year after year after year. They get to Christian. At some point, you write it down. But you, you weren't an eyewitness. Now, as a result, what you wrote down does not resemble what actually happened. To make matters worse, we don't even have what you wrote down. We have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. So you get the Jonathan. So it's hopeless. Right? That's the argument. Now, it seems scary, but... Let's look, and as an apologist, guaranteed, you're going to hear arguments that initially sound like, ah, that sounds bad. Okay, that's going to be difficult. But let's just break this down real quick and just look at one. I'm sure what's one problem up there that you can just pick off immediately? Is that, that, that's not real. How about number four? Number four says... There is no, Christian's not an eyewitness. The guy that wrote it down, he's a, he, he has no idea what is there. Also, Josh was an eyewitness, and he wasn't around when he wrote it down. But that doesn't make sense, right? Because we know that the original authors actually were there. They actually wrote it down. And even if they didn't write it down, they were there. They were around that time. Okay. So like I said, there's two gaps in view. There's the gap from authorship, 33 to 60, and the gap from authorship to today. And we're going to look at the second gap first. So Paul wrote Romans in 56, Mark wrote his gospel, 60. We use the, like I said, we use the Wikipedia time. And remember, it's actually probably much earlier. <clears throat> we do not have those original documents. Those are called autographs. We don't even have pieces of that original document. What we do have is fragments of copies. So Christian has a, uh, she writes a copy, 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 and we have tiny little pieces that we find of those copies. And this is interesting, we have a complete copy of the New Testament from 325 AD called the Codex Sinaiticus. So it sounds bad, right? The, the, the only thing we have, really, a complete copy of is from 325, it's 250 years later, after the events, sounds bad, right? Eh, not so fast. And we're going to talk about why that's the case. So this is the Codex Sinaiticus. 
you never hear anybody talk about it since it's not really in dispute, right? The, it, it is a complete copy. If you look at, I did some research and I looked at the differences between that and present day, and it's almost zero. So, uh, and the reason you'll never hear anybody bring it up is there's, there's no dispute, there's no dispute here that the contents of that thing and the contents of present day, they're, they're the same, they're identical. So what we got to get is from 325 back to 70, right? We got to bridge that gap back and make sure there's no garbled transmission. So what is a fragment? A fragment is a piece of a copy. It's not a piece of the original. This is really interesting. This papyrus fragment of Gospel of John is from 8300. It was found on eBay. Some, some Greek scholar actually saw it on eBay, contacted the owner, said, look, you can't sell this thing on eBay. It took it off, and then now it's in a museum. But it's actually, that's, the, yeah, that's, that's how common these, these fragments are. So here's the crucial thing. When a fragment is found, it provides powerful evidence that we have the original. So if you find, we have, we have today's Bible, and if you find a piece, a tiny little piece, and it agrees exactly with what we have, well, that's good. Now, it could be that we just happened to find the one thing that was in agreement. That could be. But the odds are re very remote, right, that we just happened to find the one piece that agreed. And actually, if we had the original of that thing, everything else was different. That would be extremely unlikely. Now, the more fragments we have, the more confidence that we have that we possess what was written down. So here is the two oldest existing fragments. The one on the left is this silver uh, amulet. I guess it was a, uh, uh, a decorative piece. It was from Numbers. It's found in Jerusalem, dates to 250 BC. The one on the right is, you'll hear a lot about this if you research, uh, the, the, if you're into textual criticism, is this John Ryland's papyrus P52. It's the oldest uh, of, uh, from the Gospel of John. <clears throat> now, I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, tiny little pieces of copies isn't, doesn't seem that powerful, right? I mean, how, how does that really work? We're, we're making this big deal about these fragments, but kind of on the surface, how, how, I thought that there would be more here. I thought maybe you'd find like a complete copy of the original Romans or something to prove that. Well, again, not so fast. So why are fragments important? The more you have, the better the picture is. <clears throat> and so here's kind of an illustration. You find these fragments of different pieces of, of the, the, the original New Testament in different locations around the world, and they're all dated from different times, right? So when you, and if, and if you find, every time you find one, you think, okay, that, that's pretty powerful, that helps, right? But it depends upon how many of these things you find and how close they are. Right? So the more you find, the better. That's what sets the Bible apart from every other ancient document. There's, and this is just a, a small piece. I pulled this off Wikipedia. It's a very, very small piece. The New Testament has been preserved in more manuscripts than any other ancient document. There's 5,800 complete or fragmented Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, 9,300 in, in other uh, various languages. The bottom line is um, there, there's a, a, and again, this, this, the field of study that's in view here of looking at Christian to Jonathan is called textual criticism. Uh, and one of the leading uh, textual critics is this guy called Bart Ehrman. 
Um, very, very, very smart guy. He started, he was a Christian, went to Wheaton College. He became an apologist, uh, an evangelistic Christian. And he, but he started reading the Bible and it was disturbed by uh, something that we'll cover later, which is uh, perceived contradictions in the Bible. Lost his faith. And that was <clears throat> 25 years ago, um, maybe 30 years ago. Since then, he, he is a leading voice. In, you, so you'll hear me use his name a lot. He's a leading voice in the, uh, in the skeptics field, looking at uh, and trying to disprove this reliability, right? So Bart places, from Christian to Jonathan, Bart Ehrman would place the reliable transmission number, right? You say, well, is it 50%? I mean, what's he going to put it at? And he puts it at 99 99%. So when, when he's asked, yeah, we, we know we have what they wrote down. So the, you, you'll very rarely hear uh, when you're talking to people, very, very rarely will they say, if they know what they're talking about and they're familiar with the field, they'll very rarely say, well, we don't have what they wrote down because that's an established fact. We do, 99%. And again, that's, that's Wikipedia. Um, so this is kind of an interesting slide. If you look at the time gap, um, the Iliad, 400 years, and I won't go down through all of them, but the New Testament, if you look, it, it, it's just orders of magnitude more evidence, which is exactly why they put that number at 99. So looking at a summary of the transmission through history. So virtually no one today denies that the text has been accurately preserved through history. <clears throat> 138,000 Greek words, 1,400 are uncertain today. Uh, and the ones that are uncertain, if someone has a Bible, if you could just pull up 1 Corinthians 13.3, if it's an NIV or an ESV, um, and if you look at the footnote at the bottom, you'll see a kind of a note that says some manuscripts say this, others say that, which is why I really like um, the ESV, NIV, the, the, that family of translations, is they're very upfront about, yeah, we're, uh, in this particular thing, we're, we're not positive, right? Um, was he delivered up, did it deliver up my body to death? or deliver up my body to be burned, right? We're not sure. So that's the kind of, when they talk about 1,400 words that are in dispute, <clears throat> that's the kind of dispute we're talking about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about, there's two families of uh, bodies of manuscripts. One's Byzantine, the other is Alexandrian. If you're a King James person, um, that's one that one family. It's called Texas Receptus, and there's fist fights and wars about <laughs> which Bible translation is is the right one. Uh, for us, <clears throat> the the correct Bible translation is the one that you like to read. You, we should never get hung up on which one is better, right? So wh whichever one works. Um, I, I think the, the ESV, the, the, the Alexandrian family, ESV, NIV, Dewey Reams, those kind of things, they tend to rely on the fewer manuscripts that are older. The King James um, Byzantine relies on this Textus Receptus, which is a lar large number of uh, manuscripts. However, they're, they're newer. So, so what have we done at this point? What we've done is established that from Christian to Jonathan, <coughs> it was reliably transmitted. So we kind of defeated the, uh, the telephone game in that sense. We haven't defeated the telephone game from Josh to Christian. That's still in view. We still have that problem to deal with. But we defeated the telephone game from there to there the copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, that was reliably transmitted. We know that for a fact. Now, so what's next? 
the while nobody really disputes that, what they do dispute is that this gap, that period, right, anyone that goes after virtually every argument against the reliability of the Bible focuses on this gap, this gap between Josh and Christian, and whether or not Christian has the, the events actually occurred there. So the, 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 the claims is, the, the, there's a variety of claims which we'll, we'll go through, but it, it, at the end of the day, it's crucial to demonstrate that what the Bible contains, which we know we have, but what it contains is accurate history. Otherwise, all we really have are properly preserved lies, right? So we know what we, we have what they wrote, but we can't trust what they wrote, right? Okay. This is known as biblical criticism. And biblical criticism, uh, Jeremy touched on it. I don't, you may not have picked up on it, but he touched on it uh, last Sunday when he talked about uh, that piece. <clears throat> so what's in view here? is that what Christian has, are they lies? Are they legends? Or are they actually history? Because that's incredibly important. If we can't trust that the Bible contains historical fact, that's a huge problem for Christianity because Christianity is based on the historicity of the empty tomb. Without that, there is no such thing as Christianity. It's not a philosophy that can survive losing that fact, right? If we lose that fact, that's it. Christianity's over. So now you got one gap down. We got one gap to go. So let's look at this real quick. Things are happening really fast here. Uh, Jesus, there, there's two key points to remember. <clears throat> it's a very short time period, we're, uh, and again, we're calling it 25 years, and it's a very hostile time period to any uh, <clears throat> exaggeration, to any untruth. And we're going to talk about why that is, what makes it actually a very difficult task to get a lie from Josh to Christian. Why? Why is that? Well, isn't that easy? When he tells, he tells, he tells, that, that's pretty simple. Uh, exaggerations creep in. Um, I, it, it, you know, if you have Steve telling his fish story, it's very easy for, even if he was initially honest, for it to get exaggerated as it moves around. And that is exactly what a person like Bart Ehrman who I mentioned, right, who's a leading uh, uh, skeptic, that's exactly where he attacks the, the problem. Uh, and in debate after debate after debate, uh, he, he looks at that gap and, and attempts to show that actually either he, what he initially said was an exaggeration, or by the time it got there, it didn't reflect actual events. Okay, so you don't have to remember the various ones. These, again, these are different kind of families of, uh, of, of styles of going after it. Form criticism <clears throat> um, it, it got initiated by this guy, Rudolf Boltman, in the 1900s, uh, late, no, sorry, uh, late eight early 1900s, um, and what he attempted to show that is, well, he looked at the Bible and, 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 and saw these proverbs and, uh, uh, and stories, and he, he tried to show that they didn't reflect actual historical events, they reflected a theological need, right? As an example, <clears throat> um, everyone knows the Exodus, right? The Exodus... Uh, Israel was, uh, Moses brought 
Israel out of Egypt, right? Now, and it's known as the Exodus, so they brought them out 40 years in, in the wilderness in, into Cana. Uh, now, did that happen? We don't really have any historical evidence of the Exodus, to be perfectly frank. We just don't. Um, now, does that mean it didn't happen? So the, the approach that the skeptic takes is to say, well, since we don't have evidence, it didn't happen. And what, the, what does that mean? What it means is that uh, uh, Jews in uh, 1500, well, it would be more like uh, the, the early thousands, right? They invented this God. They invented uh, this uh, story of God bringing them out of Egypt. Why? Why would they invent this story? They needed divine justification for taking over this land, right? So they wanted to, to invade and take this over. They said, hey, God told us to do this. He brought it. They invented this story of an exodus as all is divine justification for what they were doing. Same thing here. <clears throat> In the New Testament, the, the, the theory is that uh, the, the, the early disciples invent this story, right, to, to justify their group, to what they're doing. That's the form criticism. Redaction criticism is that Josh actually wasn't honest about what he wrote down. He, he selectively wrote stuff down and invented stuff. And even though it may have gotten to Christian accurately, he was lying. Narrative, Chris, uh, this is an oddball. I, you know, I put it in here because it was in the, it, 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 it rounds out the list. But no one really treats this one uh, uh, seriously. Uh, no one, for example, what they try to do is, you know, the prodigal son. Is that, was there a real prodigal son, right? Was, was that a real person? When Jesus uh, uh, articulates this story, are we to understand that he, Jesus was talking about this guy he knew, and, you know, his, his son went off and came back? No, it, it's a made-up story. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a story for a purpose. Uh, uh, people that, that try to use this type of criticism will say, well, the same thing with the Bible, right? Jesus never existed. It's the same thing as the prodigal son. Jesus never existed. Just a story. This one doesn't really get traction. The contradictions and variations, that gets a lot of traction. And uh, hopefully we have time to spend on a couple of those, but this is a big deal. So uh, a person like um, a Bart will look at the contradictions and variations and the form criticism. Those, so those are the two big ones. So we have four possibilities here. Let's look at, and I got since Steve's not here, I got to use Josh. It's Josh's fish story. So Josh Kosh says fish, right? Now, there's a couple options. You, you caught, Josh caught a six-inch fish. He said he caught a three-foot fish. Tells Kylie, tells Tim, around it goes Barry, there. So Josh lied. He caught a six-inch six fish. He told everybody he caught a three-foot fish, which then got accurately sent there. That's, that's number one. Number two, well, maybe he was honest. He said he caught a six-inch fish, but Kylie said it was a foot. Tim said it was two feet. Barry said it was three feet. Over here, Barry, uh, Christian, three feet. So he was initially honest, but by the time it got over here, it was distorted. The third one is Josh was honest. He said six-inch. Six-inch. Tell Tim six. Six. Bear. Six. Yeah. Christian lied. He said three foot. Right? So it was, it, everyone was honest until him, and then he wrote it down three foot. Now, the, the fourth option is Josh caught a three-foot fish. Three foot, three foot, three foot, three foot, three foot. Accurate. And that's what we're going to demonstrate. That's exactly what happened. The events in the Bible correspond to what actually happened. So, <clears throat> how do we go about doing this? One way would be to have a, uh, somebody else on the boat. Not, not our, our concerned parties, not, you know, not anyone that <clears throat> wants this to be true, but a disinterested person, someone else. So, 
we do have some of that uh, in remembering that Jesus of Nazareth was a nobody in first century Palestine. Um, he was not Caesar. So there, there would not have been, other than the people that were concerned and interested in this person, nobody else would have taken note of this person. So we do know that the death, burial, and resurrection have extra biblical support. Um, Josephus wrote about it, and Tacitus wrote about it, and I covered that in the first session. Um, <clears throat> I put the, there is a, uh, a link in the bibliography, uh, Gary Habermas, who, who you may have heard of, he surveyed uh, 3,500 scholars, uh, liberal and conservative, and found that four out of five of them uh, actually agreed with those four facts. Now, we can also infer that Jesus claimed divinity because, again, the fish, what you want to relate that to in the Bible is Jesus' claims of divinity, right? So the, the, the claim is that, well, he never claimed to be God. Um, he just, he, he was a very wise, uh, uh, like Buddha, like Confucius, a very, very wise guy, a very moral guy with these great moral sayings. But the, the, the claim that he was God, that the tomb was empty because it was resurrected, is a fabrication to provide justification for the religion. So, <clears throat> we do know that he was convicted of uh, blasphemy, heresy. That's why he was hauled before uh, uh, Pilate, that's why he was crucified. It's a capital crime. So we, we can kind of infer pieces of the actual events based upon these other extra biblical sources. <clears throat> so what about the general reliability of the Bible in other areas? So can we trust Josh when he says he caught a, a three-foot fish? <clears throat> can we generally trust him? Well, we can look at what he, the other things he said, are they reliable, right? So here's, this is something that's always been really powerful for me. No archeological find has ever disproved a single person, place, or event in the Bible. None, ever. It's never happened. We also have the flip side um, that There are missing pieces. If, 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 you, if, you, if you go back to 1960, suppose you're an apologist in 1960. One of the, the first thing they're going to hit you with is Pilate never existed. Pilate's a huge figure, right? The, the, the last week of Christ's life <clears throat> is 40% of the Gospels. And Pilate factors in, he's a, he's a really important figure here. Now, if we know Pilate never existed, what does that do, right? So that really casts doubt on this whole thing, if Pilate didn't exist. And that was the fact. The, uh, Pilate was the Roman procurator. He was the, basically the governor. He's the guy in charge. He's the guy that they took Jesus to, the, the Jewish leadership took Jesus to and said, yeah, you have to crucify this guy. The Jewish... Uh, uh, leadership didn't have the ability to crucify anyone. That, that was a, a Roman activity. So they, they took Jesus to Pilate. Pilate tried. They scourged him. You know the story. The, the point here is that if Pilate didn't exist, that casts a lot of doubt. And that was the case. Everyone, Pilate didn't exist until they found the Pilate Stone in 1961. So immediately, right, that cuts the legs out from under that, that argument, and it also gives you some insight into how, that, how it's argued, how that, that case is argued. The argument is that if we haven't found archaeological proof for something, it didn't happen. So kind of the default stance that, that they want to take is that uh, if it's not attested, it didn't happen, right? So it's very same uh, situation here. <clears throat> Today, um, there's, there, there's, a, there's a supposed contradiction, because uh, we, we have no evidence that 
Quirinius took this first census, right? Um, uh, they had to go back to uh, Bethlehem because they had to return to the, to the, to the town of their the father's origin um, and there be, to take this census, right? Well, there's no evidence of that. We have nothing to say, yeah, this happened. And in fact, we, have, we do have evidence that there was a census by Quirinius, but it was 10 years later, so that you, we can't line up those two numbers. <clears throat> so, of course, the skeptic will say, they made a mistake, right? They had to invent this thing. They had to invent him going to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy of being from that. So, uh, uh, and, and that's why we have this. But they're going to find, eventually they're going to find this, right? You just, at this point, we don't have it. I, I like to bring up Pilate because when people talk about this, the first census of Corinth, he says, well, it's exactly the same as Pilate. And you have a concrete example. So <clears throat> let's talk about uh, are these, is Josh a dependable person, right? How, how, how much can we trust this thing? So if you, if you place yourself back there, you have this uh, uh, person arrive on the scene. Miracles, astonishing uh, 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 events, and he's claiming an authority that has never been claimed before. He, he'll say things like, you've heard it said that, but I tell you. What, is that, what does that mean? He's actually saying, God told you to do this, but I'm telling you this. Now, think of what kind of a person says something like that. Either he's a lunatic, he's a crazy person, delusional, or he's God. So if, if someone arrives on the scene and starts saying things like this, what are you going to do? You're going to write him down. There's going to be a lot of people there. And in fact, it talks about how every place he went, scribes and Pharisees followed him, challenging this, what he was saying. Because what he was saying is either true or blasphemous. Take your pick. So, and, and very, very common. So they didn't have books. They didn't have uh, uh, the internet. Recor accurately recording a teacher's saying is ingrained in what they do. That's how rabbis worked. Rabbis would, would teach, they would write it down. Uh, accurately capturing these teachings was ingrained in that, in that society at the time. <clears throat> um, memorizing stuff, for example. So one argument is that uh, Josh caught a six-inch fish, but it got over here, and it was a three-foot fish. <clears throat> Let's talk about <clears throat> the ability to memorize things. <clears throat> now, I tried at one point in my life to um, uh, memorize Psalm 51. My wife's telling me to take a drink. And I really tried. Thank you. I really tried to memorize Psalm 51. It was really important that I do that. And I couldn't. I, I just couldn't do it. I really couldn't. I, I could do like the first, you know, first couple paragraphs and that was it. Now, is it always like that? Go back then. The requirement <laughs> back in first century, to be a rabbi, you had to memorize the Torah, the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Can you imagine memorizing that whole thing and being able to repeat it? <clears throat> That's the kind of thing <clears throat> that was, <clears throat> that was, that's how they operated. You know, I, I'm, I always search for things to relate to. <clears throat> um, and unfortunately, there's nobody here, very few people here over the age of 50. But before... Ways and before uh, Google Maps, there was this thing called an atlas. <laughs> and there were maps. 
and you knew you, you knew the roads. You, you, you know, I, I go to High Street, then I hop on uh, uh, kind of and then I, okay, I'm, I go up, I take the, the bypass to 95 North, and then I take Loop 4, and then I go up to Exit 7, and I get off, and, you know, I take a left on. You, you don't do that. You follow the little thing. You turn it on, and you follow the thing. Turn right, turn left, turn right, turn left, turn left. And what, what's been lost is that ability to remember a route, to remember the roads, right? London cabbies, to be, to be a London cabbie, you used to, you had to memorize the entire street map of London. We don't do that now, so that's lost. It's a perishable skill, it's lost. But that was not the case. We can't judge that time by this time. We have to look back at that time. And at that time, accurate oil transmission was incredibly important. Here's a huge one. Was Josh lying? Now, if Josh says that Jesus claimed he was God, so let's suppose that <clears throat> Jesus never said he was God. Um, so Jesus wasn't the one committing blasphemy. But if Josh says, Jesus said, who's committing blasphemy? Josh. Now, if, if Josh lies about catching a three-foot fish when he caught a six-inch fish, what's on the line for Josh? Nothing. His reputation. And his reputation shot already, right? Just kidding. It, the joke worked much better if Steve was sitting there. <clears throat> so there's nothing on the line. If he lies, it's not a huge deal if he gets caught. Now, is that same thing true of the disciples? You're asking me to believe that they're willing to abandon their belief in God. They're willing to blaspheme. Blaspheme. Blasphemy was a capital crime. You will, you're asking me to believe that Josh is lying and he's abandoned his entire Jewish history. He's decided, I'm just going to pretend this guy said something and what I'm attributing to him puts me in a position of being excluded from Yahweh. That's it. I'm out. I was in, and now I'm out. I was part of Israel. I was part of the chosen people. Now I'm out. So that's what you're asking me to believe when you say, ah, they invented that. They didn't. Jesus never said that. Does that kind of make sense? So there's no evidence that they would have abandoned that. Look at the rest of the, of the gospel Clearly, at every page of the New Testament, it, they take the existence of God extremely seriously. Uh, uh, look at the, the penalties. One of the, the, the negative, if you will, connotations of the New Testament is how much time they spend talking about sin and how God, we need Jesus uh, 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 to, to, to reconcile ourselves to God. That penalty, they place themselves under. If, they, if they've actually abandoned that. Okay, <clears throat> so the second thing is hostility. So getting from Josh to Christian, so Josh gets a six-inch fish. He tells Kylie, I caught a six-inch fish. Kylie tells Tim, Josh caught a 12-inch a a fish. Okay, stop right there. Is anybody else around saying, wait a minute, Josh said he caught a six, why are you telling Tim he caught a one foot fish? I heard him say to her it was a six inch fish, right? So who are these people? We talked about the hostility the early church faced, right? They faced persecution, widespread persecution from the Jewish leadership of the day. And we don't want to come down too hard on them. Because if you were a Jew in that time, you were doing the right thing. 
by persecuting Christians. Christians are pulling people out of the covenant of Israel. It's a, it's a life or death matter. It's not like becoming a, a, a I don't know what example I would use, but it would be kind of like um, a, a Christian being pulled into Buddhism, abandoning Christianity, being pulled into something like Buddhism. <clears throat> would we come against that? Of course, because th this has eternal consequences for this person, which is exactly why the Jewish leadership of the day actively at every stage was trying to debunk that conversation, right? They were making sure at every stage that it was accurate. <clears throat> so, and, and lastly, um, again, it all relies upon if, if six inch, 12, uh, 12 inch getting over here, Christian writes down something different. Well, actually, Josh wrote it down. It wasn't Christian that wrote it down at all. It was Josh, right? So we know Matthew, uh, Mark, John, Luke wasn't. He wasn't an eyewitness. But we know that three of the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses, right? So it's not a different person. It's actually the same person. And even if you assume, since there's nothing in the Gospel that says, hi, I'm Mark, I wrote this down, they were still alive. So the last thing, and maybe we will break there since it, we're at the hour, is contradictions and whether or not uh, these contradictions um, highlight uh, when we get to this point, people writing down different things to meet a need and the fact that they don't line up kind of shows that they made it up, right? So we'll do that next. So let's take a, let's take a 10 or 15 minute break and then we'll come back and... Uh, Take the next session. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. I should have asked if there were any questions. <laughs> you got to raise your hand. Sure. Memories and memories. And it's like, how do we talk to someone about that? And my answer would be, well, many of them are, are welcome to include in the memories. Like, what am I supposed to do about this thing? Right. So any cop, is any law, anybody in law enforcement here? Uh, any cop will tell you that a, a single witness is good, but not great. How about 10 witnesses? Then, OK. Now, how do, how do cops do this? They don't, they don't get all 10 witnesses together and they say, okay, what, what happened, guys? They take them off, they isolate them, and they get the, each one's individual story, and then when they're done, they, lie, they look at the stories, and there's going to be some difference. Guaranteed there's going to be some differences. But what they try to do is they try to find the historical, actual thing based upon these different things. And, and that's exactly... The, the multiple independent attestations is exactly what we have in the Gospels. And I'm going to talk later about how, you know, variations are exactly that. They're just different views of the same underlying events, right? So you've got Mark was the first one. Um, uh, Matthew and Luke authored different ones, but used a lot of the source material from Mark and John almost completely uh, independent. So, so yeah, so that's what you have is multiple independent attestations. Any other questions? I should have repeated that because they're not going to hear it on the audio. What was the pilot stone? So the pilot stone is this um, piece of limestone. That I, I was going to get a picture and I forgot. Um, it's a piece of limestone that they forgot, or that they found um, that has his name on it. Uh, and I forget what the actual inscription is, but it's just, it, it it, it was a road that he built, <clears throat> a piece of limestone on this road that said something like, you know, I pilot, built this road, you know, that kind of thing. But it just demonstrates that he's there. 
Because one thing you're going to hear a lot, if you talk to people, they say, oh, Romans were these fantastic record keepers, and we don't have a record of uh, Pilate, right? Well, that, they were fantastic record keepers. The problem is none of those records survive till today. Uh, and that's the, that's the thing. The, the archaeological confirmation we find is always all, the papyrus of the manuscripts. But when it comes to ancient Rome, most of it's, uh, 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 you know, some kind of stone, uh, some kind of steel, they call them, which is like a, a, a pillar. Uh, so something like that. So... Any other questions? Okay, let's take uh, 10 minutes then. Thanks. Let's get going. <clears throat> so to kind of summarize the, the first half of today, we established that the authorship to today, no one really argues that that was corrupted. 99% uh, preserved, and that's from a secular, again, that's a secular source. Um, so as you talk to people, <clears throat> if, if, if that's what they uh, uh, ask you about, just point them to Wikipedia, which is always the kind of the best answer for, uh, for skeptics. Getting from uh, Josh to Christian, <clears throat> we talked about how there were four scenarios. Either Josh lied, or it got corrupted there, or Christian lied, or it was actually he told the truth, Christian told the truth, it got to Jonathan and to us. Um, we talked about how getting from Josh to Christian um, we tend to remember big events, crystal clear. You may not remember what you had for lunch last Tuesday, <clears throat> but certainly you remember uh, birth of a child, those of us old enough to remember, uh, remember 9-11 very clearly. Uh, those of us that aren't that old, we remember your wedding very clearly. Um, you remember uh, the, the events of the last two years pretty clearly. Uh, that big events tend to, tend to get burned into your brain like that, which is really what we're talking about, <clears throat> is the big event of what Jesus said during his life. Uh, we talked about how as he's speaking, as a rabbi, People are going to record what he said. He's going to have students, which is the disciples. That's, that's what that word means. Um, uh, listening and making sure that what he said gets accurately uh, remembered. Uh, we talked about how uh, the, capa the capability of remembering accurately back then is completely different than today uh, because it was... Uh, a, a skill that they lever that they used and developed every single day. Um, and we talked about how if there was any exaggeration, that that would have been opposed, right? There was a feedback there that the, the society at large at the time <clears throat> was continually trying to say, no, 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 you didn't catch a three-foot fish. And here's why. Uh, so if there was any, if there was any in historical inaccuracy of what they were saying, the original disciples, it just it, it would not have made it into print, as it were, without being challenged. And there's no evidence of that. The only, um, the only evidence we do have is that we know the Jewish leadership of the day accused the disciples of stealing the body. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you the tomb was empty, right? If someone's being accused of stealing something, obviously it's not still there, right? And that's, that's the earliest polemic that we have is exactly that, which, again, uh, uh, verifies the, 
Now you have to deal with, well, did they? Which we dealt with in the first session. Are there any kind of questions on that, those pieces before we kind of move on to the contradictions? So the contradictions, this is what caused uh, people like Bart Ehrman to lose their faith. Um, is, is he looks at what he sees as irreconcilable differences in the Bible and says, well, they can't both be true because they contradict. There's just no way to harmonize these things, right? Therefore, it's not historically accurate. I can't trust this thing. I can't, if there's two, two accounts of the same thing and they contradict each other, how do I, I have no idea what actually happened, right? And that's what caused his loss of faith. Now, what we're going to talk about <clears throat> is variations, uh, and you brought up, Lauren brought up, where you have these two, you have many different witnesses, right? And they're going to have a different story. Now, <clears throat> in one sense, that's bad because, you know, it would be better if you had 10 witnesses and they had identical. Now, but can you expect that? And the answer is no, because different people bring a different worldview to these things, and they're going to record it differently. And, and also, the authors we know, Mark, for example, and Matthew present Jesus differently. Different in the sense of highlighting uh, aspects of Jesus' ministry, right? So Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience, so he's going to focus on establishing Christ as king, Christ as Messiah. Mark is more focused on establishing the humanity of Christ uh, as the son of man, the suffering servant. <clears throat> so we talked about redaction and how you pick certain events. You know, at the end of, of John, he says, you know, Jesus did a lot of stuff. I wrote these things down. Why? So that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So John is admitting freely, look, I didn't try to write every single thing down. I picked pieces. I, I told you he did this and this. Now, each one is real and true, but he didn't attempt to completely document every single event of his life. That would be impossible. So it's not bad to acknowledge that the authors come in with a purpose, right? Um, you'll, hear, you'll hear someone like Armand say, well, they're not disinterested parties. Granted, granted, they're not. They're writing this down specifically because they know Jesus is the Messiah, that, Jesus, that the tomb is empty. That's why they're writing this. If the tomb wasn't empty, they wouldn't have written about Jesus of Nazareth. They wouldn't have, right? If, if, if he was crucified on a cross <clears throat> and his body laid in a tomb and it decomposed, that would have been the end of it. Just like a number of different uh, Messiah pretenders, Jesus wasn't the only person that, that claimed to be the Messiah. <clears throat> there were others. Now, why don't we have any biographies, gospels of them? Well, we don't because they, they, were, they died and that was it. The movement went away, right? It, precisely the, the, the thing that Nicodemus said, he said, don't, it, be careful what you do to these guys because if it's real, <clears throat> you're going to be fighting against, against God. So, the variations, if people say there's variations, say, granted. But getting to the historical reality, right, distilling many different accounts and, and accurately understanding, that's what cops do every single day. Every single day, that's what they do. That process is understood. There's nothing wrong with looking at these different variations. Now, there are reasonable harmonizations of, of these contradictions in the vast majority of cases. <clears throat> I, I, you know, I've looked at, I have a book at home. I should have brought it. 
that has like that, that deals with uh, that tries to deal with these things. And I, you know, I, I look at some of the harmonizations and I think, eh, I don't know, that, that that doesn't seem to work for me. But in most cases, there are reasonable harmonizations. Genre, and we don't have time to go into specifics of it, and it's it's really an interesting discussion. But we know that there's po- genre says. So you know, the Psalms, for example, it, it's a different style of writing than the Gospels, right? When you look at the Psalms, are you, are you looking at history in some cases, but you're also looking at a lot of poetry. And in poetry, <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of figurative, use of figurative expressions. In the Gospels, that's actually history, Right, with some stories in there, the parables. The parables aren't actually history, and when we read that, we understand that. But the, there is historical events there. So, first contradiction, and I grabbed. <clears throat> I just went to uh, atheist.org. I forget what it was, and they had the whole list, and I just grabbed like the top couple, and, and we're just going to look at them. So this is a pretty easy one. Is, it, is the earth permanent or not? Well, one says the earth remains forever, Ecclesiastes 1.4. 4. Second Peter says it shall be burned up. So is it permanent or not? Contradiction, can't trust the Bible. All right, well, genre is really important, right? So the genre of Ecclesiastes is wisdom, Right? Second Peter is a, is a letter, it's an epistle. So, and, and the Bible will frequently use this term forever in a more limited sense, right? Just to mean long time. And it doesn't literally mean an eternal existence. But the harmony here is, is fairly straightforward. Ecclesiastes is talking about the principle of man's existence Uh, mortal existence, as compared to the permanence of the earth, right? That's that's the the distinction it's bringing out. Second Peter is talking about something completely different. It's talking it's a it's a theological uh, commentary, eschatological commentary on the end of the of the of this reality of this universe. Questions on that? That one's pretty easy. They get harder. How about the Sermon on the Mount? Was it done on the flat or on the mountain? Well, Matthew 5 says, he, seeing the crowd, he went up on the mountain. He sat down. His disciple, so he's on a mountain. Luke, he said he stood on a level place. So what is it? Either you're on a mountain <clears throat> or you're on a flat place. Contradiction. They made the whole thing up, tossed the Bible out. It's unreliable. So there's a couple options here. The first option that is that he gave the sermon multiple times. Matthew records one, Luke the other. That seems reasonable. Um, that's what preachers do, right? He would go to a town, and if, if we followed him around, you, you probably get, all right, look, man, I've heard this before. You just said this back, you know, you, but they haven't heard it yet. That's why I'm telling these guys they haven't heard it yet. And that's probably exactly how he preached. He preached the same thing over and over and over and over. So the first option is that Matthew's recording one, given on a mountain. Uh, Luke's recording another, given on a flat space. That's how it, you would harmonize it. Uh, number two uh, this, you know, I brought this up because uh, uh, it, it is an option. To me, this seems kind of, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, it, it talks about how uh, the, the placing it on a mountain kind of reflects, they didn't actually, we don't actually know where it happened. Matthew puts it on a mountain to, uh, to highlight the, the correlation of Jesus with Moses on, you know, so that kind of thing. That, to me, <clears throat> I, I put it there because it is an option, but... It didn't seem particularly uh, believable. The third option is, it's actually the same sermon. They're, they're talking about the same thing. It's a flat spot on the mountain, like an amphitheater, 
right? That kind of makes a lot of sense to me. Because if you're talking to large groups of people, they can't see, you know, they can't see you if you're here. And so it would make sense, in, in the same sense that he rode out on a boat to talk, it, it would make sense that he would talk in a place that kind of naturally had decent acoustics and people could hear him. So that kind of makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, option four, this is a redaction option. Um, actually, the, the sermon, what's recorded there, never actually happened uh, as it's listed. They are groupings of separate sayings that are organized under the topic of one sermon. So that's an option two. Personally, uh, option three, to me, makes a ton of sense. Option, op, option one or option three uh, are certainly reasonable harmonizations. Questions on that? How about this? So this is one Josh asked about. Um, the, the genealogy of Christ. So, <clears throat> so Luke says he was a son of Joseph, so, so it was thought of Joseph. Matthew says he's the son of Joseph. But if you look at Joseph's dad, why are they different? In Matthew, Joseph's dad is Jacob. In Luke, Joseph's dad is Heli. So that's a contradiction. Chuck the Bible, unreliable. So the first thing, <clears throat> Jeremy wanted me to bring this up. Both lineages uh, are the same to David. Uh, Luke goes back to Adam, but to David, they're the same. Uh, and that's to establish that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy of being the son of David from the, from the stump of, of, of David. Um, now, but what do we do about Joseph's dad being different? And traditionally, uh, the, the way to harmonize this is that Luke, Joseph's an asterisk, and actually he's talking about Mary. So it's actually Mary's dad who is Heli, right? Because it says, so it was thought. And that's kind of Luke's way of saying, well, he, he, that wasn't, you know, so it was, yeah. It, Joseph wasn't his dad. So he traces it through uh, Mary. And that kind of also aligns with how Matthew presents Christ as king, and he's the legal heir to the throne, and how Luke <clears throat> presents Christ as a son of man and the biological. So Jesus was, is the stepchild of Joseph, <clears throat> but the actual child of Mary. So blood, from bloodlines, you've got to go through Mary. Uh, through uh, uh, legal standing, you've got to go through Joseph. So legally, you would, you would trace it through Joseph, which is what Matthew does. Luke uses the bloodline. Questions on that? So that's kind of, the, like I said, the, the traditional understanding of how to reconcile those two. So we're going to finish early, which is good. So, <clears throat> so we started off with how do we get from the events, Josh, to the authorship, Christian, to present day, Jonathan. And we first looked at that, and we established there's really no issue there, 99%. Here, we looked at <clears throat> the four possibilities. You lied, or you told the truth, and it was exaggerated. You told the truth, and it was true, and then he lied. Those are kind of the three uh, uh, possibilities there. And we talked about how the, the short period of time, the widespread 
claims. So this wasn't a claim made in isolation. They were widespread claims. This group is, is gaining popularity. The Christians are, 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 are this sect, this blasphemous sect of people uh, in a very tight, closed community is, is gaining popularity. It's actually growing pretty rapidly. Um, and it would be, you know, akin to some explosion of uh, people moving from Christianity to Islam today, right? This is, you know, what's going on here? So you're going you're gonna to attack it. You're going to attempt to disprove it. A very hostile route from Josh to Christian. Every single thing is going to get challenged. Uh, we talked about how, well, actually, it wasn't Christian that wrote it at all. It was Josh that wrote it. It was the original, witness, the original eyewitness. And even if it wasn't the original eyewitness, certainly he was there, right? And again, this isn't an isolated thing. It wasn't like, like uh, Christian wrote it down, <clears throat> and then it kind of remained hidden for 100 years. And then 100 years later, someone grabbed this thing, and boom, it exploded. It's exploding right there, right? So, and, and we talked about, well, can we trust Josh? And the answer is yes, uh, we can. Uh, why? A, you look at what they put at risk by making these claims. Um, it, it was their eternal destination, it, which is yeah, at risk. Um, so they're reliable. We talked about how everything else they wrote down is reliable. So we know that no person, place, or event in the Bible has ever been disproved. <clears throat> That's not saying that we can, that the resurrection has been proved. I'm talking about the empty tomb. But we know that in general, the Bible is extremely reliable. We know that archaeologically, everything we find confirms that reliability. Acts, for example, has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of places, uh, events, and people, uh, all of which can be fact-checked and have been fact-checked. And everything we find is real. They even found a... a <clears throat> there's, a there's one thing about in Acts how Paul is shipwrecked, and I think it's on Corsica, and uh, while he's there, he swims ashore, he's soaking wet, uh, and they build a fire to warm him up, and uh, when he's throwing wood on a fire, there's a snake in there. It comes out and hits his hand. Uh, it poisons a snake. And, of course, the inhabitants are thinking, oh, well, jeez. He's saved. He got saved from the sea, right, only to die on the shore. God clearly wants this guy dead, right? Um, and, of course, he lives. And they say, oh, my gosh, he, this guy's a god. He, he, he survived this fatal snake bite. He's a god. They actually found a legend on Corsica of this god that showed up on the island. And that's that, that's that event that got, you know, it got, of course it got changed a little bit because Paul was never God. They, they said, you must be God. And Paul said, no, 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 I'm not God. But that's what survived. They're like, well, obviously you're God, right? No, no one escapes all that without being God. Uh, and, and those are the kind of things, <clears throat> act as an example, just as one book that has so much detail in it, historical detail, that can, that can all be fact-checked, if any of that was inaccurate, it would have been debunked. But time after time after time after time proves itself to be reliable. Now, so again, not every person, place, or event in the Bible has been verified. Uh, the first census of Quirinius is a good example. Yeah, Tim. Um, let's say we found the Pilate stone, but it turns out Pilate lived in uh, 90 AD. If we could demonstrate <clears throat> that Pilate lived, you know, 50 years later, that's a, that's a problem. Um, if you can uh, demonstrate that uh, Jesus lived, 
50 years later. Um, or if you can demonstrate that, uh, like, like some other examples, let me think. Any of the archeolo any of the, the facts of Acts, for example, right? If we can establish that Paul uh, uh, never made these trips because the, the cities that he talks about, they don't exist, right? If we could do that, well, maybe they just made this whole thing up. Paul never, you know, did that. Uh, the, 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 empty, the empty tomb, you can't really establish that archaeologically. Uh, you can demonstrate that disciples were talking about the empty tomb at the time. If you can show that, for example, the view that the tomb was empty arose much later, that would, that would be a big problem. Right? Those, those kinds of things. So if you can uh, find a fragment of something from you know, 50 uh, AD that says that, uh, you know, the Jewish leadership investigated this thing. They found the, the body in the tomb. Um, and, you know, we've effectively put this thing to bed. Right? It's not an issue. Those kinds of things would be, uh, would overturn, you know, it would cast doubt on it. Anytime you can disprove a claim, any claim, it, it tends to cast doubt on it. So everything you disprove casts more doubt. The fact that not everything has been proven, but, what, but nothing's ever been disproven, that's an, that's an important piece of info. The Journal of Biblical Archaeology is a good, you know, if, you're, if you want um, kind of like a survey of those kind of things and how they find time after time after time after time after time, um, uh, it, you know, they dig something up. The Exodus, I think, is a good example of, if we could somehow show <clears throat> that the Exodus never happened, that would cast doubt on the whole Israelite origin story, right? Because if, if, the, if, the, Jews, if, if the Jews were just a Semitic people that, never were in Egypt. They just, you know, started in Cana, and they got more and more powerful, and they started taking over, and they wanted to kind of invent this divine justification, and they said, well, you know, God's on our side. He brought us out, you know. But, you know, if we could somehow show that never happened, that would be pretty powerful. Any other questions? So, if you go back to the original six thing, right? The disciples told stories about Jesus to gain a following. These stories, get, these stories get told and retold. They're in circulation year after year. We, we, they, at some point, it gets written down, but we have no idea. I think that's, that's, the, that's the piece that, at this point, we've addressed. So, the summary is the Bible accurately reflects the life and sayings of Jesus. It is reliable history, and that's really important. The authors preserve those sayings in events. The hostile contemporary environment ensures that the biblical text has been accurately transmitted through history, the contradictions have reasonable harmonizations. Uh, variations represent different takes on the same events. So we can take as historical fact that the tomb was empty. The question, and that's kind of how we, we ended the first session, was, okay, well, if the tomb is empty, that's a historical fact. How do you explain it? And that's what we talked about in the first session, is, is that the, the statement, God resurrected Jesus, is the best explanation for that historical fact. And we talked about how, you know, all of the challenges, the swoon theory, disciples stole the body, the twin brother theory, um, all of these things, they, they all fall. There's just no, they've never gained any traction. Uh, so in the in the skeptic world, uh, 
those attacks on Christianity really have, have fallen off in the last 50 or 60 years, and it's this, this uh, biblical criticism now looking at the transmission from the event to the authorship that, that's, that's any debate you get on the historicity of the Bible, it's going to focus on, on that kind of thing. So that's all I had, and we finished early. Is there any questions? Yes. Right. <clears throat> right, 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 right. <clears throat> so the question is, what, is there any evidence that when it was written down, is it, was it just three people that wrote it down and that, that's it? Yeah, and I think I'm more thinking of, obviously, the teachings, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I would say there's probably a lot of focus on that and a lot of what's going on in the teaching, but that's kind of the way it happened. Right. We know, for example, Luke, that's exactly what Luke did. Luke's gospel starts off with, look, I'm, I, I investigated this whole thing. I talked to the eyewitnesses. I talked to these different people. And here's, here's an accurate accounting of what happened. So Luke's a good example of someone who did precisely that. Not an eyewitness, but he investigated it and wrote it down. The other thing I'll bring up is... Um, Kind of the feedback loop that exists in a, uh, if, for example, you take this group of people and we witness something, right? <clears throat> now, uh, a, a cop will take Nicole and, and, jo and, and take them into different rooms and, and, and you know, ask, the, you know, see if they can get these different views and then they'll compare it and they'll try to find a common historical fact underlying these different points of view. Now, Suppose that instead he sat up here and said, well, what happened? You would provide your view, and then but what's going to happen if you do that is people are going to say, wait, that's not happened. That's not what happened. So there's going to be this self-correcting uh, process by which people say, no, no, that wasn't it. And it, actually, when you have that kind of situation, that's another very effective way to work out what exactly happened. There was a car accident in front of our house uh, uh, last week. My wife and I saw it, and um, it was funny how even when I told the kids about it, she kind of like, well, that wasn't, you know. So she was kind of helping me, you know, get, get to that. Right. And, and that's how, that's another reason. I didn't talk about it, but that's another kind of feedback loop of, of how oral transmission kind of checksums itself and make sure it's accurate. Um, it would be very difficult if you had this whole group of people that saw something, uh, and, someone, and someone walks up and says, okay, what happened? You know, you're gonna get, as a result of this collaboration, oh, no, that's not what happened, right? That, that's gonna get to a, 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 a historical fact the same way that interviewing people independently will do, but yeah. Right. <clears throat> so the argument there would be that, um, and you kind of see that today. You see it today where a take, yeah. right, a take on an, on an event, uh, 
I won't go into the whole political thing, but the point is that there's a, there are narratives today, right? So something happens and someone has a political uh, position that they want to cast this event in. And it's, you're almost like, wait, there's a spin, right? There's a spin, there's a narrative that gets kind of repeated and repeated and repeated. And um, half of the country says, well, that's not what happened. But they're afraid to say anything because they fear the, the, the response from the other half, right? So you don't want to say, well, wait a minute, that's not right. Because, ah, oh, man, you think I'm going to get fired, I'm going to lose my job. You know, did that happen back then? Um, today, you have, in effect, a ruling body, and, and the minority, as it were, is, is kind of rejecting this view of things of the, of the majority. I mean, communist Russia, for example, you, you got the Communist Party says one thing, and everyone says, oh, well, that's not true. But they can't say anything, right, because they get chucked in jail. Um, did that happen? Then. So back then, it's completely different. It's a very small group of people, right? The, the ruling class back then was the people opposing it, right? So the, the, trying to say that, well, no one objected to what they were saying because they feared, you know, a response, the exact opposite is true. People are not going to make this claim because the ruling body is coming down hard on them, right? So that's kind of the, the fact that they face such opposition to their claims demonstrates, and, and the fact that that claim is based on a historical fact of an empty tomb, um, that it, it shows it's incredibly difficult to come up with a scenario where they just invented this thing. You just, nothing gains any traction just because of that. So, any other questions? Yeah, John. So, uh, death and beauty is a great discussion. I'm going to read some stuff right. that I'm sure that some of the big events or right. some of the smaller contradictions there. Right. Uh, but, you know. So, in Acts, Judas is hung. Matthew is hung. Matthew is hung. In Acts, well, it's he pitches, right. So, in Matthew, Judas. Uh, realizes that <clears throat> he's betrayed an innocent man. He's, he's, he's very remorseful. He goes out and hangs himself. In Acts, it says he pitches forward and his bowels burst out. And I had that, um, but I didn't include it because I thought we were going to run out of time. That, that's a tricky one for sure. Um, I would say the prevailing harmonization is that he hung himself. He was hung there so long that his body de de uh, uh, decomposed. At some point, the rope snaps, and he falls. And when he falls, he pitches forward. The intestinal gases have built up to the point where, you know, it you know explodes. That's one harmonization. I personally, I don't find that harmonization that appealing. It, uh, I don't, you know, <laughs> eh. That, but I will say that's part of the prevailing harmonization. Um, the, the, the harmonization, to me, what makes most sense, you know, what do bowels mean, right? So the bowel uh, as a figure of speech. Like, so we always talk, what does gold mean, for example? Gold is purity. Gold has a sim gold is a, is a, a mineral, but it also has a symbolic uh, aspect of it. And, and they talk about uh, purity. Um, Bowels represent kind of the seat of your emotions in, in the Bible. And, and pitching forward and, and the, you know, that exploding, I, I think that's a figure of speech. That's how I would reconcile that. Um, I, I think he's just saying, yeah, his, his, yeah, his, 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 seat of, his seat of emotions just, you know, exploded. That's kind of how I would harmonize it. Yeah, Christian. Yeah, go ahead, yeah.
right. Sure. So I think um, here's a good lesson as an apologist. I'm not convinced there is a good harmonization for the death of Judas. Personally, I put that in the ca in the in, in the bin of uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, and and we, you should never be reluctant to just if someone asks you to say, look, here here there's a couple options. I'm not sure. I don't really embrace any of them. I, I'm just not sure at all. And that's fine. Um, because one, there's a principle here of admitting that you don't know. Um, prior to 1961, we didn't know about Pilate. And I would have said, I don't know. We don't have any support at the moment. I don't know. Uh, it came to light. It would be nice if we uncovered something linguistically that said that pointed to kind of a mistranslation, so that that harmonized it. That could be. Um, they every year, if you look at the NIV, uh, uh, how it's revised, it changes because um, what happens is they continue to do research on language and they come to a better translation, right? Because English, it wasn't written in English initially. It was written in Aramaic. Um, uh, so, or Greek, rather, and uh, we don't really know perfectly how to translate that. So it could be a translation issue, um, yeah. but in principle, don't get rattled if you can't come to a harmonization or something like that. So, Certainly, Luke and Matthew were aware of each other, so the, the idea that they were written in isolation and came, that doesn't really square because they were certainly aware of each other uh, since they share, uh, uh, in addition to the, the underlying core of Mark, they actually share other things. So it, I, I, I tend to, either it's a translation issue or it's kind of a theological coloring of the event. So, any other questions? Great. Yeah, sure. So, so right. So uh, <clears throat> the question is: There are some books left out. So it's called canon, uh, and the question is: Who decided what's in the Bible, and who decided the Gospel of Thomas, for example? There's a, there's a whole body of work called the Apocrypha uh, that's not included. In, the Bob, in our current day Bible. Um, it is, for example, portions of it are included in the Codex Sinaiticus, uh, but not in our current Bible. So who decided that? And I didn't go into that, but uh, it's essentially there was a list of uh, a, approved or a, a list of authentic uh, uh, content circulating I think Marcion maybe the first, and then you know it got revised, got revised, got revised, and um, the Emperor Constantine uh, said, "Okay, fine." In 360 something, uh, said, "All right, you guys, you decide. I want to know what's the authoritative list." So they came up with what is our present day list, which is what you see uh, right now. Now there's other things, and we didn't, like I said, we didn't talk about you know, why they're not in, and do they disprove um, the, the, the contents of the Bible? Maybe we can do that next time. But um, I think, in general, the current contents, the current canon was selected, the criteria is <clears throat> either it was written by an eyewitness, or in the case of Luke, 
a person only once removed, written by, you know, who investigated it. So uh, you don't kind of get that, you know, second and third degree of potential uh, variation. So written by an eyewitness was probably the, you know, the... Sure. Yep, Barnabas, Thomas, Judas. There are many other Gospels, many, uh, but none of them are in there. So, any other questions? All right, perfect, right on time. Thank you, thank you.